Okay. So welcome everyone. And um, thank you so much, Gwen and Zach and Heidi for, for stepping in as, as panelists for this roundtable discussion about scenario-based learning. Um, so my name is William Cronier and I am uh, representing Eduflow and Eduflow Academy. Um, and at Eduflow Academy, one of our big goals is to uh, share with people that there are way more interactive ways of learning online than just videos and quizzes. It can be more engaging, it can be more social, it can be more inactive, or interactive and active. And um, one of the ways that we can do that is through scenario-based learning. <laughs> and um, we've gathered some really, really cool people um, at the, uh, to, to chat about this topic um, for this roundtable dis discussion. Um, and yeah, I, uh, I, I think we'll just get started with the introductions. Um, I'll just uh, maybe, Gwen, can you introduce yourself and maybe tell us a bit about Mersion as well? <clears throat> Absolutely. Thank you, William. Hi, everybody. It's lovely to meet you. My name is Gwen Baker. I'm the Chief Learning Officer here at Mersion. Mersion is a platform um, that allows learners to practice the skills that are important for effective leadership. And I'd say the communication skills that are effective for um, building a practice where one is effective as a leader and inclusive. So really thinking through how to really force um, the development of the things that are important that we know are successful to drive business objectives. That's me. And I think we'll get into a little bit more of the details of merging when we sort of talk through some of the questions. I will um, pass it over to Zach, my colleague. Thanks, Gwen. It's nice to see everyone here, meet everyone on the call. My name is Zach Gottlieb and I am the VP of Revenue here at Mersion. I've spent the past 11-ish years, going on 12 years, focusing on how adults learn new things in large organizations. So I've hopped around a couple of different um, organizations from kind of digital skill building to well-being and uh, stress management to executive education. So love talking about this topic, would love to to dive into the conversation here. Um, obviously, we can speak a lot about immersion, but this is a broader ecosystem of opportunities for learning. And so we want to just engage um, with you today. So thanks for having me. Cool. And Heidi. Hi, everybody. I'm Heidi Kirby. I am a customer education manager by day. Um, and in my free time, I teach a podcasting course for the University of Florida. Um, I have a little L&D podcast called The Block Podcast, and I've co-founded um, Useful Stuff, which is a website for resources for L&D professionals. Um, and I teach a scenario-based learning cohort-based course with Eduflow um, and present in the Instructional design principles for course creation. I can never remember the whole thing. Did I do it? Did I do it right? <laughs> Yay. Um, a, a workshop during that course on scenario based learning as well. Cool. Thank you so much. Um, okay, maybe I can kick us up off with the very basic question, and that is what is scenario based learning? Um, and uh, if you want, you can follow it, it up with. Why do you think it, or you know, why is it such an effective approach? Um, Gwen, can we start with with you? Sure. <clears throat> so, thank you. Scenario based learning. It is uh, rather than sort of saying what is it, I would say what are the principles that I would think about from um, scenario based learning. I also would really talk about the fact that it's grounded in research. So really grounded in cognitive research that to me and, and others who really study the practice are around authenticity of practice. That authenticity of practice is really driven to um, to allow learners to do something that they don't love to do, but they need to do in order to learn, which is to fail. Um, and failure is really essential um, so that one can be able to have what at Mersion we would call those light bulb moments. We would sort of, from the cognitive science approach, call it that aha moment, which is where am I on a path to achieving an outcome? Something goes wrong, something doesn't go well according to the plan that I had had. 
that aha moment is a learning moment that allows you to understand you know, the learning by doing, it allows you to achieve the learning goal. And so what I would say about what is uh, tied to the question, is there such thing as a good and a bad scenario? I would say, well, I won't go good and bad, but I will say effective or more effective scenario. So they are authentic, grounded in a realistic goal. They are relatively challenged, meaning that they are not, you know, if somebody was a beginner at learning how to ride a bike, I wouldn't put them on a Ducati motorcycle. I would probably start them out with a, a tricycle. Um, they, that consistency of the scenario needs to be consistent throughout. Um, and then they also, the learner needs to get information about how am I doing while I'm going? We might call that responsive. You might be getting feedback that says either if you are interacting with an avatar as you are in immersion, you would have some sort of feedback nodding as, as Heidi is nodding. Or if Heidi didn't agree with me, she might either just be stalled here, sort of waiting to jump in or saying something, but there's some sort of cue or feedback that helps me know how I'm doing in the pursuit of that goal. And then it's also really, I would say, supportive. So, right, if I want people to be able to fail, I need to provide to them a safe environment where the consequences may be relevant within the context of the scenario, but in the real world, I'm not going to get fired if Heidi doesn't agree with me. So it's like that combination of those things lead up to what is an effective and um, more effective learning activity than I would say a not effective learning activity. And um, I guess I will leave it there. That was a really amazing, thorough answer. Uh, oh, that sorry about that. <laughs> um, so, uh, um, uh, Zach and Heidi, do you want to add anything to that? Uh, do you have like your own unique perspectives? I don't have too much to add. Um, I think I'll add that. Um, you know, we can we can kind of think of scenario based learning at a micro level, the way I kind of like to give people a mental model is like the choose your own adventure books that you might've read as a, as a kid, or even um, it might be an example of not really successful scenario-based learning, but like math problems, like story problems that you did as a kid too. Like to me, I, I Gwen hit it, like uh, hit the nail on the head by saying um, the principles, right? you have a scenario, you have choices to make, right? And there are, you know, good, better, best, or, you know, different types of choices you can make. And those choices determine um, the next question in a lot of cases when you're using branching scenarios, but scenario-based learning doesn't have to be branching. It can be standalone at the end of a course or something like that. Um, and I love what Gwen said about the scaffolding and the safe environment, right? Because the research has shown that when people feel like they're in that safe environment, they're more willing to notice their own deficiencies. And so they're able to better self-reflect and having the scenario, having that story helps people to retain things better too, because storytelling is just a really good retention method for us as humans. And so presenting the information in that way gives, um, you know, is really helpful as well. Awesome. Uh, Zach, would you like to add anything? I don't know how to follow those two explanations. You're making it really difficult. Um, I'm, I'm just interested in the dynamics of, of scenario-based learning when it comes to you know, the modalities. So I have, you know, a lot of times people think of kind of the traditional MBA case study. Your, your team is dealing with the launch of a rocket and there's news that comes in. What decision do you make? Um, I think that's really useful for practicing team dynamics, power dynamics, um, influencing negotiation. Um, and the, the trade-off there is, um, which I think you know, Gwen and Heidi alluded to, there's a trade-off of psychological safety in that situation. So I think there are different applications for kind of group situation learning or scenario-based learning where we all have this suspension of disbelief. I know I'm not launching, launching a rocket tomorrow, right? But we all agree to the same principles and the context and we say, I'm gonna jump in, I'm trying to take that spirit of play and improvisation and play along. Um, 
there's also a challenge with adults being good at that and role play. So there's some dynamics there in a group that, that can be a challenge um, versus kind of individual scenario based learning, which is no one can help me. I'm alone. Uh, it's almost like the basketball versus golf type of analogy. Um, and I think there's use cases for both and we can talk more about them. But um, when it comes to this, I think the intentionality of a learner journey or what you want to get out of someone going through a scenario as an individual, as part of a team, psychological, psychologically safe or uh, more exposed to others are all parts of the consideration when you're thinking about how adults will learn something and have behavior change stick. That's awesome. I, I think maybe uh, since we've got like um, the immersion team here, I, I, I wonder if you could share because the, the way you're doing a, um, scenario based learning is, is clearly very unique. So could you maybe uh, share an example of what a scenario based training intervention would look um, from your perspective, one that, that you've designed, maybe walk us through the journey from the perspective of a learner. I know I'm putting you on the spot. Um, <laughs> but if you if you're willing to share, that'd be amazing. Why don't you start it, Zach? I, I feel like I've been. Yeah, sure. I, I mean, I think this this ties right into the, the learner journey flow, right, William? And I think um, and Gwen's, Gwen's got some great learning models that she's uh, used in, in slides to demonstrate this. I think there's a, a key aspect of priming people that, hey, this is what you're going into. Right here, are kind of the rules. So the principles Gwen spoke to earlier are the things like there's going to be context. You may be playing a character. You may be playing yourself. This is a group or an individual. Um, this is the time you're going to spend doing this. Really setting expectations and saying, let's agree on this. Right. Um, from there, there's kind of I think two different ways to approach this. One is, can I use scenario-based learning as a baseline, which is almost like an assessment or a diagnostic. Hey, what would you do without any additional training? What's the status quo? What do you bring to the table right now? And you learn something from that exercise. Uh, another way we see it is, okay, let's prime you with kind of academic exposure. Here are the behaviors you should exhibit in this situation. Here are the right things you should be doing. Where you say, great, I'm totally gonna do those in, in the real world. I promise. We know that's not always true. Um, so the idea is scenario-based learning can then provide that bridge, which is, oh, practicing this or doing this when it's on me to do it, it's actually, it's actually pretty hard. And so the idea is kind of there's this use case for kind of diagnostic, learn what I'm missing or learn the opportunities for growth and then re-engage in academic uh, context. Or it's, hey, I just saw someone do a really good job. Let me go give it a shot. And so I think there, there are different types of learner paths you can create with this, but those are kind of two predominant examples. Um. Awesome. So uh, I, I think maybe we can uh, pick up on, uh, so someone in the chat asked, how effective is scenario-based learning um, in teaching soft skills? Uh, and I think that that maybe um, introduces another tough question, which is um, what type of training is scenario-based learning ideal for? Uh, can uh, is, is it ideal for soft skills or are there any other environments where it can be applicable? Um, uh, Gwen or Heidi, maybe I can put either one of you on the spot here. Go ahead and go. Um, so as far as soft skills, yes, um, a lot of the research on scenario-based learning is around soft skills um, in like very specific contexts. So like, um, you know, this is just an example because I can't remember the exact ones, but like looking at leadership skills for um, first year medical student or medical residents or something like that, right? And it's like looked at in very specific contexts. Um, but I think that it doesn't have to be soft skills. So what we talk about with scenario-based learning is that the ideal environment for scenario-based learning is what we call ill-structured problems. Um, and those are the opposite of well-structured problems. Well-structured problems are things where there's one right answer and one wrong answer, right? So logging into your computer, doing a specific job task, those things are well-structured problems. The reason that scenario-based learning works so well for soft skills is because they're inherently ill-structured problems. There's multiple ways to get to the outcome there's, um, you know, there's gray areas, there's multiple answers um, that could be the right answer, right? And so 
Um, when I'm building out scenarios, I even will include the thing that's the bad choice, right? If we want to call it that, the bad choice, the good choice, and then something in between too, because you can have an okay, right? Like people get along in life by not doing the things that are considered best practice, messing up, but just kind of like riding in the middle. So when you have a situation that has all of those different, um, those different possibilities, um, you can use scenario-based learning. So like, for instance, we've used it, um, I've used it in hazard analysis training, like considering hazards and looking for hazards and things, which is a really technical topic and has nothing to do with soft skills. So, yeah. Awesome. Uh, Gwen, would you like to add anything? Yeah, I would just um, absolutely concur with Heidi, with your description there. I would I would argue that scenario-based learning or the idea of where Heidi had talked about, which is motivation and engagement are essential to any piece of learning. I have to think about how I want a learner to commit the mental time, the seat time, anything into it. And that really relies to motivation, motivation and engagement. What is the case for why? And those things can be compelling through either something that is, I'll go to what Zach was talking about, to a business problem, or let's say I wanted to teach someone about operations, I could build a scenario that focuses, that allows you to run a McDonald's franchise. And I could give somebody that, somebody who works in, let's say a pharmaceutical company, that task, totally separate from what their work is that they're doing, but it is, as Heidi said, a complex task. If I've done it as motivating, motivating and engaging, I can get them to, I could engage them in it. They could learn these practices and processes and they could transfer those skills elsewhere. And I think that part that Heidi was talking about really said to me, the transfer piece. I wanna design a scenario that is, I understand the complexity of a particular task or skill, I understand where it may be applied in different places. And then I may design a scenario that allows you to use your memory, use your story, think about how to apply those to, to other contexts. Awesome. I, I think uh, some of the questions here and um, a lot of the things that you've kind of hinted toward um, in the discussion so far um, talks a bit about um, psychological safety um, uh, feedback re and reflection and freedom to fail. Um, and I'm really curious to hear about um, what the role is of those mechanics um, and how you design for them. Um, how do you uh, fit all those different uh, things into your learning journey or your experiential journey? I can start. Uh, go ahead. I, th <laughs> I think it's multi-layered, right? Like, so when I, I think, uh, I think I could think about those questions about preparation, the practice opportunity, the reflection in the course of a scenario. But then I also understand that that scenario or that activity or event is probably happening in the context of a larger piece. And so all of those things, preparation. <laughs> explaining the why, making the case for why, preparing the learner, giving a real practice opportunity that is supportive, that allows you to fail, um, and then really having an opportunity to reflect on that activity are essential pieces that I would say need to be built into everything. I think I'm, I'm like sort of reading. Um, one of the questions is like, when I think about where would I use it for technology or not for technology, um, those principles apply everywhere. The question I would have is how much time, budget, and resource do I have would really determine where I build these things into the either the software or the experience that I am building. And those sort of cost trade-offs lead me into design. Cool. Um, Zach or Heidi, would you like to add to that? Sure. Um, I'll just add to that. And I'll, there was a comment too about um, providing feedback throughout. So I think a couple of things. Um, the psychological safety, you have, there's a really a balance um, because you want to present 
plausible alternatives when you're having someone work through a scenario. But if we think of psychological safety um, in the sense of being able to innovate and share new ideas, you have to be really careful when you're creating those, um, those different decision points because if you present something that would be considered as innovative, innovative and then you have that be something punitive as your, as your answer option, like, oh, this isn't what you should do this because this goes against the process, right? Um, then you're kind of discouraging that psychological safety, right? You're discouraging innovation. So you have to be really careful how you set up the choices. Um, and that goes for the biggest problem I see when I look at other people's scenario-based learning is that they have like very obvious wrong answers, right? And I think that that's part of it too, is that if you want somebody to fail, you don't want them to do it like <laughs> on purpose, right? Like that they go through and get all the answers right. And then they go through and get them wrong on purpose or something like that, right? You want them to really think about it. And like one said, reflect on what they're doing. And I think as far as providing feedback throughout, you don't need to say, oh, good job, you got this right. The feedback can come in the form of what happens next in the story if you're doing a branching scenario or um, you know, in the form of questions or in the form of discussion afterwards, like a social learning experience. So there's so many different ways to give feedback. But I think to the question of psychological safety, it, there really is a balance. You really do have to look at the situation and make sure that the best answer is really the best answer and that that's agreed upon by your subject matter experts and stakeholders as well. And that um, having those good answers and having those not ideal answers is what's going to give you build in that psychological safety and let people know in a real similar situation what's okay. Awesome. Zach, did you want to add anything? Well, I'm the least qualified panelist about instructional design. However, I'm just as enthusiastic. I, I mean, uh, I've been enjoying some of the chats around kind of the, and to Heidi's point around this, like the obvious wrong answer doesn't help, right? Because you're trying to help teach someone something. So you can't say, oh yeah, why well, it's a real tough choice. When Kate says hi, do I punch her in the arm or say hi, right? I, I think, um, you know, Gwen and, and my day-to-day -day in the immersion world is uh, almost on the radical end, which is there is no stopping point in the middle of a conversation because we do live-based uh, interactions, right? So these are actual conversations. We have actors, they play the avatars that interact with our learners. And so the idea is just like in a real conversation, you can't say like, pause. Well, you can, right? But you can't say pause and simulation because it's a coworker and um, that's gonna be a challenge for how you relate going forward. But the idea is that um, feedback comes in many forms, right? So in live conversations, it can be expressed in body language. It can be expressed in pauses or inaction, people closing their eyes, looking stressed, right? So there's, I think there's a, a whole wealth of feedback that happens in live interactions that's different than when there is more of a branching scenario, right? When an opportunity to pause and evaluate, and so I think when we talk about soft skills, power skills development, right, there has to be this broader sense of what feedback looks like, whereas in maybe into this chat, you know, if there's a product or a very specific technical training, uh, it may be uh, more comfortable, more appropriate to say, well, you just cut the wrong wire, like, let's, let's go back to step one, right? So I think when we think about the dynamics of the situation in real life, interacting with a kind of a dynamic counterpart versus a static counterpart is a big consideration here. Um, when you think about what feedback really is, what it looks like and kind of the learner experience, do you want to take them out, right? Or do you want them to stay in the moment, even if it's going terribly, like it might in real life? Um, I'm actually really curious about this format. So you've mentioned, you know, you've got actors and you've got avatars. Um, can, can you tell me about, like the maybe not the the finer details but like how is this training delivered like what does it what does it look like um do you learn a sign in uh using vr goggles or um what is yeah what is that format um that that you use to deliver i'm i'm happy to answer gwen 
this is this is one of your favorites too. I don't want to steal your thunder. It's your call. Um, well, the interesting thing is we want this to be as representative of a day to day as we can. So we actually, this is the platform, right? It's a video conference. Um, and so the idea is we have learners appear as themselves. We have um, avatars appear as avatars. And the idea is, you know, you create this psychologically safe environment. I don't know the person on the other end. I'm practicing this conversation, but it's dynamic, right? So that we actually have a simulation specialist on the other side um, appearing as an avatar who's speaking and hearing and, and role-playing with you in real time. And so the idea is um, kind of in the world of scenarios where there are, you know, oftentimes multiple choice branching, or, you know, it's like, hey, say this sentence that you would say in the situation. And then, you know, natural language processing will determine if it's correct. We have someone who can get mad at you, right? And, and, and so that's the biggest difference. Um, I don't want this to become a full on sales pitch for immersion. Um, welcome to it, but different, different venue. I think the idea is we're really just trying to tease apart, okay, when we think about soft skills, when we think about interpersonal performance, like what is the best way to practice that? And what we've learned from tests with VR goggles is 50% uh, of people get dizzy. And um, it's also hard to distribute that technology. So for a lot of our organizations that say like, I want people to practice how they um, work together on video conferencing, because that's what they're doing 90% of the day, we say, great, that's the format that we want to deliver in. Um, so um, a lot of different modalities here, but that's kind of the position we take, which is live conversations for practicing live conversational skills. I know Gwen, did I miss anything? Heidi, you may have a perspective on this as well. No, the only thing I'll add is that um, I'm, I'm reading a little bit more of the chat about sort of the scenario, the underlining scenario design is that essentially these simulations, immersion focuses on interpersonal communication. So if you wanted to learn about how to build a financial model, we're not the place to do that. It is really about that sort of conversations that are best one-on-one -on -one or one-to-many. Um, every, all of the conversations are event-driven. So essentially, as we think about that, like, what do we want to have happen? What is the like agitation that we put in that we will, that will allow the learner to practice the skill that they want to practice? And so that design, and if it's okay, um, I think this is pretty standard to how lots of other folks think about um, scenario design. It's like, I would say it's not particularly unique, but essentially every scenario is designed around this idea of giving someone a mission and story, an opportunity to prepare to get their head around what they're going to do, a practice opportunity, some way to debrief and reflect, and then some level of data around how did I do? How did I do compared to my colleagues? How did I do compared to others who are doing this work? How do I compare to like people based on the, you know, their experience level? But this is something that we sort of use that this structure holds true for any kind of simulation. It's a question of how much meat <laughs> do we put in it? What is the challenge we design? But I, I see Heidi, like, I think this is a pretty sort of basic learning opportunity that you would see as a common application. And so I would say to the, the person who was asking like, eh, does this work for software training? I mean, it could, um, but really I think the software training, I think the concept of learning by doing, which is rather than teaching someone the skill of you click this button, click this button, click this button, hit save, you're done, move on to the next task embed that task in a meaningful activity that like that is important to them. So if I wanted to figure out how to do a transaction, give them a sample transaction to wire money somewhere, um, you know, using your software. So I'll stop talking. <laughs> I think that there are so many amazing nuggets here. Um, and uh, we also are getting incredible uh, questions and, and um, insights in the discussion. So um, Gwen, Zach, Heidi, if you want to answer any of these questions as we as we discuss, you can just put up your hand and say, I want to talk about this that this person brought up, because um, I, I feel like we've got a bunch of really, really cool um, uh, questions here. Um, uh, Heidi, is there anything you'd like to add? No, yes and no. I think what Gwen said is great. I think that kind of 
what we're not saying out the part we're not saying out loud is that like the principles of good learning still apply right like we don't want to just default to scenario based learning for everything because it's not appropriate for everything right and you really do still have to think about the outcome and what is it that you want the learner to be able to do afterwards and so like when was saying with software training it doesn't really make much sense because with software training there may be more than one right way to do things in terms of clicking but that's not there's not a lot of nuance to that right so like scenario based learning for how to use our product may not be the best thing um but if you are talking about something like how to troubleshoot a software right and that there's there's more complexity there so those types of situations but again at the end of the day the learning outcomes are the most important part and to gwen's model um the amount of like preparation that you give somebody before they go practice also varies right like sometimes you just dump someone into a scenario just to see how they fare and then you let them do it again after you give them some pointers or sometimes you give them a whole lesson first and then have them go through the scenario so again it really just depends on the outcomes and the goals for learning as to how you use scenario based learning it's just another tool in our toolkit uh, awesome. So uh, maybe I can um, uh, throw in another curveball there with a with a different question. Um, before you start your scenario, what does your analysis look like? How do you uh, learn more about your audience, for example, so that you can make sure that the scenarios are relevant to them? Um, do you have like a, a secret formula that you follow to to do this analysis to make sure that the training is an appropriate solution? um zach or gwen uh, gwen you've already unmuted go ahead i think it's really important to understand the domain so as we talked about authenticity and realism you really need to know what is the context for the activity that i want to simulate if i do something like so that means that you know i spend because we're thinking about communication in um, leadership and mostly in business environments, I spend a lot of time researching well and building a model around uh, a domain model around what are the domains of communication? What are the essential skills? How do I think about those essential skills? I do research um, on sort of common problems that come up and then think about how to design scenarios that allow people to practice those particular common problems. I think anywhere I, I'll go way, way back in the machine to where I was. Um, one of the first simulations I built while I was in graduate school was around teaching folks about the context of the French Revolution. And so we were working, I was at Northwestern University, we were working with the French history department and we wanted the simulation we built was we wanted people to understand, well, what was it like to be um, a journalist at that time? What was it like to be aristocracy? What was it like to be? And you took a tour of the gardens of Versailles and were able to come across each different sort of character in there to learn about them. And your goal in this scenario was to convince them to become revolutionaries. The only way we could do that was to really dig in and understand what was like do research on the French Revolution at the time to understand what were those particular char like characters, what was their perspective, what did they care about, so that I could develop right the right events and interventions and agitations and the right level of feedback that would help people to really understand what it was like then and when. Uh, Heidi, I noticed you nodding vigorously. Um, I'm yeah. sure you've got something to add. I love that example. Um, so when I am asked the like classic interview question of when's the time that you worked with a difficult SME, um, I always talk about like a very specific scenario based learning project that I was on. Um, and it's not that this me was intentionally being difficult, but like he just didn't understand the idea of scenario based learning or what I was trying to accomplish. Um, most of his learning had been done via lecture. Um, he had like binders of printed PowerPoints. And so, you know, I eventually just had to say, okay, sit me in a room and tell me what I need to know about this. And then I was able to take that lesson 
and, and turn it into something. But for me, the biggest thing is when you're doing the needs analysis, you have to make sure that you have the right people in the room and get them to come to a consensus. And sometimes that is really hard because there are multiple options, because there are multiple correct choices. Sometimes your stakeholders and your subject matter experts are not going to agree on what is best practice, but you have to get them to come to a consensus because otherwise, if you go ahead and create something, someone in the organization is going to say, well, this said I got this answer wrong, but in my opinion or in my expertise, that's the correct way to do things. So you really have to make sure that you're bringing the right people in from the planning stage so that you are not misleading anybody and so that you can have consensus across all of your different stakeholders. Uh, maybe uh, Zach or Gwen, do you have any top tips for dealing with um, subject matter experts or, or stakeholders generally? Um, I'm sure that you come across um, uh, uh, the people who you often have to convince that this is the right solution and that the way you've proposed it maybe is, is a good idea or, uh, you know, how do you involve them in the process? Yeah, it's, um, I mean, I, I, I might take a more radical approach just to stir the pot here to, to Gwen's point about agitation earlier. Um, Cause I, I know some questions in there about there's, there's often this idea around, you know, custom things trend towards customization, right? And I think one of the fundamental questions um, people ask as, as instructional designers and business stakeholders uh, should be, how much do I actually need to customize, right? Or get the direct involvement of a client side SME to make something useful. And I think we are always challenging that. So at least from a power skills, soft skills perspective, I think we look at kind of this idea of transferable skills which is like, do I want to have someone practice the exact type of customer complaint they're going to see in, in the field? Because it's going to change every time. The personality of the person is going to change. The complaint's going to change. The nature of the resolution is going to change. Or do I focus on the, the core skill of de-escalation in that situation? In which case, does it matter that I am, you know, as a learner or as my, does my counterpart, do they have to look exactly right? Do they have to be in exactly the right environment? Or is, a, is that core skill what we're targeting? And so I think there's often this initial question that I would recommend everyone ask, which is like, what's the minimum viable level of customization or contextualization that actually matters for a specific skill? For something that's really technical, right? Or something that's safety-based, probably better not, you know, cut corners, you know? Uh, it's good to have kind of technical specificity, right? You're building to spec. But I think one of the questions that we always want to push for is like, what are you actually trying to have someone practice? Uh, almost like uh, we use this weightlifting analogy a lot, right? It's like I, I do bicep curls at the gym, not because I'm like out there all the time doing bicep curls with stuff, right? It's because when I'm carrying the groceries, my biceps are involved, right? But it's a dynamic motion. So it's like, I, I think there's this um, juxtaposition of kind of core skills, transferable skills that are more generic and don't require resource intensive, expensive, exhausting design and development. Some things do, but it's a fundamental question is, do I need that? So I'm, I'm trying to agitate Heidi and Gwen, you know, we welcome to deescalate uh, me on the call. No, I, I, I think that's right. I also think there's something around understanding the domain that's important to the subject matter expert. And so I think sometimes as instructional designers, we don't come in with enough, I think, advisory to sort of say, hey, I know that this is the problem or right, being able to transfer that to sort of say, this is a challenge, giving and receiving feedback. I don't need to know your organization very well to know the research that the particularly, this is a really difficult skill for all new managers, um, <laughs> for most humans in general, but new managers in general, the research is telling us that um, folks that report into new managers don't stay at companies because the feedback is really not effective. And here is the places where across industry, lots of people need to develop these particular skills. That's the kind of like, I think, authentic understanding of, I know your business, I know your goals, how to convince that, right, 
hearing feedback from me in one context is going to make the learning so much more effective. Awesome. Um, uh, maybe we can move on to uh, uh, the next question, which is scale. Um, so uh, you've, you've mentioned that, um, you know, you've got one on one um, training with actors and stuff. So how do you scale that? How do you um, uh, transfer that to like a really big audience? If you could train an entire workforce, for example, um, uh, how do you scale it and still keep the, the, the impact um, really good? Uh, we're in the process, right? So Mersion is a company that's been around for seven or eight years, and we're trying to really think about how are we going to scale this at a level where we could deliver this to every large company everywhere at any time. And I think how we're scaling it from the, because we do have a human in the loop is that there's lots of different ways that we're thinking about scale. One is through delivery model. How do we make the simulations available when learners are most likely to take them. So for example, if you're working with folks that have a really busy Monday through Thursday schedule, how, and most people have no meetings Fridays or professional demanding Fridays, how do we make more availability of folks during those particular times to handle that? We also think about, because we wanna think about the sort of the cultural um, transfer from South Africa to the United States, we need to know that like, right, how are we thinking about having talent pools that are available and eligible to be able to deliver understanding the differences in culture? So I think the scalability question we have is, oh, and the third place I'll say is just on the technology. How is it that we're able to capture and get enough data and delivery to, you know, to allow the humans to do what the humans do best versus what the software does best. And so I'd say there's multiple ways in which we're trying to think through how to deliver to scale. And it is and it is technical, human, and location-based um, sort of thinking and application. Does that sound fair, Zach? I, I always start with yes when you ask me that question, Glenn. <laughs> no objections for me. <laughs> Um, Heidi, would you like to add anything to that? Um, not really. I just, you know, I mentioned choose your own adventure. I know Clea talked about it in the chat too. Like it can be fully textual, right? If you're a good writer, I would, I would caveat that with you have to be a really good writer and be able to really paint a picture with your words. Um, but it can be just text. Or it can be, you know, AI interactive like Mersion, right? So the scalability really kind of depends on your resources, right? But it is truly by nature a really scalable type of learning, right? You can do it individual, you can do it socially, you can do it, you can mix it with VR, AR, AI, whatever, or it can just be plain text, right? So I think that the options really lend themselves well to scaling. But to Gwen's point, you do have to consider all of those different pieces. Um, and it's a lot easier when you're creating something for one organization, because then there's kind of the organization is the container to make sure that all of that scalability is, is happening. And then the only last thing I'd say there is that there is some part where sort of technology is important and that is for data. So how is it that you're able to capture data and understand whether or not these things are effective and to be able to report back to the stakeholder who asks you to develop, develop a, um, a scenario. And so that could be, right, capture data it could be through an interview or it could be through a survey or it could be through the software but it, I think it's really important to use that to capture and and report and understand how you're going to improve upon the the thing or the scenario or the item that you created that's awesome um it, this actually reminds me of a, a game I played a while ago called um Detroit Become Human I don't know if, if other of you've played it before but it's just like um, I played it on a PlayStation, but it was uh, this really, really amazing 
um, story-based game where you are a, an android and you have to make decisions and you can you know walk around and interact with the environment and ask questions and at the end of the the level so they've got little chapters and at the end of the chapter it shows you how, what percentage of the players followed specific decisions when they uh, and what that led to so it, it's really really interesting and i can only imagine the insight that they must have about human behavior just by looking at the decisions that that people make you know we, even when they think that no one's looking you know <laughs> so they they could probably have like a really honest perspective of of um of human behavior and i'm i'm sure to some extent we can probably get some really interesting insights about our employees or about our, our team members just by thinking about like what is the the gut reaction to this question when everyone has like what is the average reaction to this question in the team um and that could teach us a lot about um our, our, our problem and the solution so that's really awesome um i think let's open it up for uh q a um i we've we have a, so many questions on uh, on the chat here um and i'm also going to invite uh anyone who wants to ask a question um verbally you can put up your hand um, and and uh, I'll yeah I'll ask you to unmute yourself and you can ask your question. Um, otherwise, um, uh, Gwen, Zach, and Heidi, we can uh, read the questions in in the chat. And if you'd really love to answer any specific one of them, um, please just go ahead and answer them. I, I think we've got some really cool ones that have come through. Um, so yeah, uh, if you are in the chat, please type it in or put up your hand. Um, one question that, that from earlier that really stood out to me, um, I, I can't remember who asked it, but it was about, um, peer groups. So how can you uh, do scenario based learning in groups, uh, like together, uh, have you done that before? And if so, what does that look like? No. <laughs> okay. I mean, uh, I, I was waiting. I, I mean, how do you, it's, a, it's the exact same process. So yes. So um, one of the, I think, interesting projects that I'd call out that I worked on, and this was when I was in um, management consulting, was essentially a large company, a large telecom had built a, um, was doing an installation of SAP. And it was redesigning the entire shop floor. And so it was a global rollout and change. And so essentially we built a live simulation of the shop floor that we took around from place to place, but we developed an authentic thing that had the entire sort of manufacturing plant using SAP and using it in the new context of a redesigned shop floor. And so it's the exact same process that we laid out, sort of what's the cover story? So what, like, how do you prepare for it? How do we give them the right appropriate practice opportunities? How do we reflect on it? And then how do we capture data to understand how people are using and integrating this new system? Awesome. Um, I, I see we've got some hands raised, which is awesome. Uh, Nick. Great. Um, quick question. Can you hear me? First of all, make sure my yeah. mic's okay. Um, so thinking about scalability, um, and you had this conversation about, you know, you have to reach consensus when moving forward, right? You can't have one person kind of hanging back and then tanking it later, saying the training was worthless. Um, in your experience, what is kind of the cap as far as number of participants where really? you're able to reach consensus moving forward? Is there a hard number that you've kind of run into? No, I think it's more about finding out who the stakeholders are, right? So if you're doing sales enablement, you're going to want your senior sales leaders as part of that conversation. Um, so you really just have to more make sure that the right people are involved rather than many, because the more people you get involved, the more different answers you're going to come up with. And of course, there is very much such thing as too many cooks in the kitchen, right? Like, especially when it comes to SMEs for any kind of learning design, right? I'm sure if you've experienced it, you know. Um, so it's more about getting the right people involved in the conversation um, and the 
people who are going to be supporting, promoting, um, you know, leading by example using those learning experiences. Um, Gwen and Zach, would you like to add anything to that before we? Uh, okay. Um, Cleo, go ahead. Sure, thank you. Uh, this question is pretty similar to that. Um, hi, Heidi. <laughs> but I think it's mainly like if you have two SMEs and they're both very strong experts in the thing and they still disagree on why the best answer is the best answer, like would you include, you know, SME A says it because B says it because this, SME B says it because this, or like do you not worry about their opinions as much as what's important in terms of the outcome? I think, again, it depends on the goal. And sometimes when you have that much friction and that much disagreement, it points to a bigger problem up the line rather than what you can solve with the scenario-based learning experience, right? So if it's a process problem, if it's a, you know, if the thing that they're disagreeing on is how to execute a particular process, that process needs to be explored by the people who are in charge of making it. You're no longer trying to solve something with training at that point. You've uncovered like a larger organizational problem. So if it really comes to that much of an impasse and you can't find like a happy medium answer, um, because in theory, you should be able to say, okay, well, what if we combine what the two of you are saying and give the option of doing this? Um, so then there's some alignment there. But if you can't get people to agree, it's usually indicative of, of, of a problem that um, L&D should not be solving. Like somewhere, somewhere, someone somewhere else should be solving it. Thank you. Um, Gwen and Zach, would you like to add anything to that? OK, uh, Stephanie. Hey folks, uh, this is kind of for the immersion team. So obviously you have actors who are trained to play that avatar role. If we were gonna try to replicate that with our trainers and host some kind of train the trainer event to make them more equipped to do these role play scenarios in real time in like a one-on-one -on -one or small group environment, um, what are some coaching aspects that you prepare your actors for when they're preparing for these different role play scenarios? Yeah, um, thanks for the question, Stephanie. I think it depends, right? But I, uh, um, so there's certain things that don't depend because immersion is delivered over a platform, right? So there's multifaceted training that we provide to our simulation specialists. One is how to use our software, right? <laughs> like that's a that's sort of like the prerequisite to be able to come in and deliver a scenario. We provide a lot of scenario training capability. So folks are become certified on scenarios and then are able to deliver those particular scenarios. They um, get some domain expertise. So what does it mean to be a manager in a mid-sized corporate organization? What do they care about? Um, what should they care about so that we can give the right responses? And then um, there's a lot of just really understanding about what are the skills and what does and I say good look like, but how do we develop a shared understanding of effective practice and ineffective practice and what might it look like in the course of a particular scenario? So I'd say that those are like, um, it depends on what the scenario is about, but those are some things that I think are important. How to deliver it, what's behind that, how to respond to common reactions um, and and what's what's, how do we develop that common vision of effective scenario? Thanks, Gwen. Awesome. Um, we've got one more raised hand from Mugda. Thanks, William. Hi, everyone. Uh, my question is about our past. I was working on a course some time back. Uh, it was about hiring for diversity and merit. And Client was really fascinated about using avatars, different avatars, and letting the learners choose uh, an avatar. But what I failed as an instructional designer was that the uh, content for hiring diversity and merit is going to be necessarily the same, irrespective of whatever avatar the learners choose. And therefore, I wanted to focus uh, more on the content rather than uh, avatar, avatar thing, because then uh, 
it was significantly more development time and significantly more expenses for the voiceover recording and other things. So in that case, how do you convince your clients? Because they were really fascinated. They wanted these three, four avatars and you couldn't convince them. So how do you convince them about, uh, but the avatars are not adding any value in here. I guess this goes uh, back to the the stakeholder buy-in um, and and those uh, tips and tricks. Um, uh, Gwen and Heidi, do you have any um, specific advice that you can share? I think that it's not unique to scenario-based learning, right? It's unique to um, learning and development and trying to sell your solution. And so I think there's some important groundwork that has to be done um with with all instructional designers right is to understand the business understand the business goals and start building those relationships of trust so that when you do present those ideas when you do you know push back that there's some value for your expertise in knowing what the right solution is the best way to engage people um you know the best way to reduce cognitive load and get people motivated um, and sometimes you just kind of have to try and bring your your um, academic reasons, but without kind of quoting your sources, right? Like you don't want to write a paper on it, but some of the reasoning behind it and saying, you know, hey, I don't think this is going to work because, you know, our people tend to like whatever, any kind of metrics that you can bring to the table as well um, can also be helpful and convincing. but it's really about building that relationship of trust. And I find that that's easiest to do if you are transparent the whole way. So um, you might show them the alternative, right? Like, hey, here's what I'm thinking instead, you know, and, and if it's really effective, hopefully, hopefully not always, they'll see that, right? That's awesome. Um, I also realized that we've I'm got, ready. Um, we've got just a few minutes uh, left and we probably have to wrap up so people can um, uh, go to all the meetings that they need to get to. Um, I, I just want to say thank you so, so much for for, for joining us for the session, um, uh, um, everyone. <laughs> um, I, I think we can all agree that we have learned so much from this and, and I think um it, it it's been a really really awesome experience and the recording for this is going to be brilliant uh, I, I think people are going to be um very excited to to re-watch this and um to uh, again engage in all the follow-up activities and stuff from this recording um uh Gwen Heidi and Zach do you have any um closing remarks or any would you want to recommend any resources that we should check out and um, where can we find you on on social media you can type in or share all your links in in the chat or you can just unmute and, and tell us where to find you um Gwen maybe let's start with you sure you can find me on LinkedIn I kind of have eased off of other pieces of social media um, so you can find me on LinkedIn and you can find Mersin on LinkedIn. Um, the place where I always send people to, because for me, it was one of the most um, learning, like aha light bulb moments for me was Alan Collins wrote a paper called Cognitive Apprenticeship. And that is what I was like, sort of my go-to touchstone for thinking about effective design and design experiences. Awesome. Heidi? Just getting ready to share a couple links in the chat. Um, my LinkedIn, you can connect with me there. Um, Ruth Colvin Clark has a book on scenario-based learning, which is really good. So if you want kind of a primer, um, that's a good book to check out too. Um, I'm gonna share, there's a, a newsletter I subscribe to um, called If Interested. I think um, they have got some great guests on there uh, and some really interesting topics. So I put that in the chat. Um, I'll do something I'm sure I'll regret if you if you do want to try out Mersion or just meet with me to talk about this stuff. Um, I put my calendar link in the chat. Happy to connect on LinkedIn too, but uh, I just love talking about it. Um, and you know, to the extent that we can just uh, have conversations that further your work, in instructional design, always happy to have them. So uh, 
thank you uh, so much for your time today. Thanks for convening us together, William. Awesome. Yeah, it was such a pleasure. Um, I, I realize that we we've, we've got so many questions in the in the chat that weren't answered, and I, I feel really bad that we couldn't get to them. I feel like this could easily have been uh, like a two hour session, just because it like the amount of brain in this room has just been incredible. Um, we will have a discussion um, in the follow up course where you can ask extra questions and. And we'll hopefully answer them for you. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, uh, please keep in touch with us on on LinkedIn. And we'll be sharing the um, the recording with you with you soon. Um, yeah, thanks again, everyone. It it really has been a great session. Have a great day.